So we've talked about waiver, we've talked about, corporate, uh, we've talked about incorporation. Let's talk about the very last area, which is something Matt was asking about earlier, nutrition advice. Um, dietetics, so, so let's take an example of, of when this happens. Let's look at Ohio. Ohio has a provision that prohibits the practice of dietetics by unlicensed individuals. You have to have a dietetics license to give certain types of nutrition advice. And then it defines the practice as a bunch of things. It's not important that you know all of them. The one I'm going to focus on is number two, nutritional education. That is not defined anywhere in the Ohio statute. There's no, defi there's no statutory definition for nutritional education. So what does the Board of Dietetics do? They pass a regulation defining it to try to give some clarity to what the heck this nutritional education actually means. In this case, it's a, and you can tell a lawyer wrote this, uh, a planned program based on learning objectives with expected outcomes designed to, I'm done. Um, <laughs> we'll talk, we'll, we'll, we'll try to figure it, we'll try to unpack this later. Now, why is all this important? Why am I talking to you about agency law? Because how the agency passes its regulations is important to understanding why there's a lot at stake. Here's how dietetics laws are enforced. The Board of Dietetics, if they think that you have engaged in unauthorized practice of nutrition, kind of a strange concept, but if you've done the unauthorized practice of nutrition, they will hold administrative proceedings. So usually it's some sort of a trial type setting, although it's not as formal. There might be internal appeals processes within the Board of Dietetics. But bottom line is at the end of that proceeding, they'll reach some sort of a, of a determination. They might say either you're liable because you did unauthorized practice, or they might say you're not. After they reach their decision, you can appeal to the state trial court. But here's the problem. The state trial, because remember, the legislature is giving a lot of deference to the agency under agency law. The legislature gives the Board of, D of Dietetics the ability to bring clarity to this. So as a result, those courts are going to pretty much uphold whatever the agency says as long as it's not unreasonable given the statute. So if the statute says X and the regulation says Y, that's unreasonable. They're not going to uphold that. But if you try to say, for example, that Ohio's definition of nutrition education or counseling is unreasonable, the court's going to say, well, no, it's not defined. And that's a pretty reasonable looking definition, at least in our view. So you can appeal the whole way up, but the bottom line is, if you're nailed in the Board of Dietetics, it's gonna be very difficult to be able to plead with a court later on. That's why all this agency law stuff is important, right? Because as a practical matter, the agency often has the final say in what those regulations and statutes actually mean. So let's talk about what actually these dietetics laws prohibit. Now, dietetics laws are, there's, there are a lot of similarities between state laws and there are a lot of differences. And I think you have to look at your individual state law to know what's prohibited and what's permissible. But I've broken them down into what I think are three helpful categories. Category one, I know for a fact I'm right on these. There's no regulation at all on it. They just don't regulate the practice of dietetics. Category two, they only regulate the title. So you can't say that you're a dietitian unless you have a license. You can't say you're a nutritionist unless you have a license. As a practical matter, we don't really care about categories one and two. As long as we don't say we're dietitians, we're in the clear if we're in one of those two states. Category three is where we have issues. Not only do they regulate the use of title, but they regulate the practice. If you don't have a license, you can't practice dietetics. And if you are either, either if you live in a category three state, or if you are giving advice to somebody who lives in a category three state, these law, you have to be careful with these laws. These laws apply to you. So here's what I think the breakdown is between the laws. 
I think. There are three states that have no dietary regulations, and that's Arizona, Colorado, New Jersey. You're, you're good there. You're good there. Category two, uh, there are three states there. Category two has 25 states. There's actually a change on this one from the April article. I actually think Delaware is now a category two after I read the regulation and the statute over again. I think they're probably a category two instead, so I've moved them over. So, I mean, as you can see, there are 28 states that I think are category one and two. That's over half the nation. So we're actually pretty good in those states. The category three is where we could have some issues. So let's talk about what actually is prohibited in category three. Now, again, these statutes are all pretty, um, you know, these statutes are all pretty broad and they're all a little bit different. So. I'm just going to give an example that I think is pretty representative of the lot. I think Alabama's is actually pretty representative. The integration and application of the principles derived from the sciences of nutrition, biochemistry, food physiology, management, I don't know what management is, and behavioral and social sciences to achieve and maintain people's health through the provision of nutrition care services. All clear, right? This, this statute, as you've all seen, is not very helpful because we don't know what nutrition care services are. Fortunately, the states define those too. But it's still not very, and I'm not gonna go specifically over these, except to state that the kinds of nutrition advice that we want to give our trainees arguably fall into the, some of these categories. And I'm just gonna leave it at that. Um, it's very difficult to say what falls in the practice of dietetics. It, it really is difficult. So how I like to think about it from just a CYA perspective is look at the exclusions. If you fall within an exclusion, you'll be safe. So, you know, be, just because it's difficult to assess what is included in this definition. So let's talk about what I think are the big two. Now, every state has different exceptions, and you can, you know, you can certainly look at these. These are the most wide-ranging exceptions. Like, for example, some allow you to give uh, dietary advice to your friends or your acquaintances. But that's a very small number of states. I think only two of them allow, uh, three allow, one allows family, one allows family and friends, the other allows family, friends, and acquaintances. Um, but unless you live in one of those three states, I think one of them's, I, I think one of them's Nebraska, but I can't remember the other two. So you're not going to get much mileage out of that. But first, dissemination of literature and information. Now, eight states expressly have this exception. And frankly, I think this exception probably is implicit in the First Amendment anyway. You can't tell people they can't publish a book. So, you know, so I think if it's a, if it's a question of, like, you want to give a nutrition pamphlet out or you want to give somebody a book, I think this one's covered. I think you're fine with that one. Um, the problem with that, of course, is that by nature, a book or a pamphlet is general, right? I mean, you, if you give somebody general information, it's not necessarily specific to their particular goals. So that's where this other exception comes into play, general nutrition information. Now, 12 out of the 22 states have that kind, I mean, that's over half, so it's actually a pretty big exception. So what is general nutrition information? There's not a lot of legal authority on this, to be quite honest. In fact, there are only four pieces of authority that I've been able to find on this topic. One of them is actually a very helpful attorney general opinion from the Attorney General of Maryland from 1986. And I think you'll see why this is helpful for us as coaches. What they say is the non-medical nutrition information exception means that an unlicensed nutritionist may offer nutritional counseling or information if the consumer seeks the service or information to achieve overall fitness, medically unsupervised weight loss, or a generally healthier diet. That's a kind of what we do, right? By contrast, only a licensed dietitian or licensed nutritionist may offer nutritional services or information in response to a consumer's specific physiological complaint or in relation to a medical diagnosis. If they have diabetes, you can't recommend a paleo diet to them. 
that's treating, that's treating a medical or physiological condition. If they have, actually the, the, the Attorney General opinion references insomnia. I didn't realize there was like an insomnia diet, but I guess they were worried about this in the 1980s. But you can't recommend a diet to somebody to treat their insomnia, for example. What's really helpful about this exception, or, or this opinion, is that the Attorney General actually says elsewhere in it that non-medical nutrition services, quote, are of the kind traditionally provided in settings like fitness centers, end quote. So the Maryland Attorney General basically recognizes that as coaches and, and gyms and personal training in general want to give people advice to help them with their performance goals and help them lose weight in a medically unsupervised way. I think it's very helpful. What about if you're doing ob uh, medical, or what if you're trying to treat obesity as a medical condition? And what I would say is, is two things. One, I mean, yeah, it could be a little malleable, but Rip, you're not helping them be, not be obese. You're helping them become less fat. Ah. See, it's not a medical condition. You're just trying to help them lose weight in a medically unsupervised way. Right. They're just fat, right? You're just trying to help them lean out. You know, I, I mean, I had to lose a few pounds for a powerlifting competition. You're doing the same thing on a bigger scale, no pun intended. Where somebody got in trouble with this, there's a guy in North Carolina named Steve Cooksey. And uh, he was a diabetic who went on a paleo diet, had incredible results. He actually got to go off medication and he lost a lot of weight. So he started a website where he talks about how great the paleo diet is for people who are diabetic. And he actually ran what, was, what they referred to as a Dear Abby column. People would write in about their particular issues and he would respond to their particular issues. And then he offered a lifetime coaching service for money. The North Carolina Board of Dietetics came down on him hard, as you would expect. But interestingly, the things that they nailed him on primarily were the Dear Abby column and the uh, nutrition coaching. That's really where they hit them hard. In terms of the general thing, in terms of things like general meal plans and giving his own story and why he thinks it's helpful, they let all that go. Because it's just, because they can't prevent somebody from publishing a website that contains general information. So we talked about uh, the Maryland Attorney General, and really this is pretty consistent with the other states that have come up with their own versions of general, non, general nutrition information. Now, there are two states that define it by statute, Montana and Nevada. This is almost a carbon copy of Montana's statute. Nevada is a little bit different, but it, substantively it's pretty close. So what, what are, what's covered under this? Principles of good nutrition, just generally healthier stuff, eat fruits and vegetables. Foods to be included in the daily diet. The essential nutrients needed by the body and recommended amounts of these nutrients, I think that's awfully close to what we do. Because we're kind of saying, you know, if you want to perform to a certain level, you're going to need a certain amount of nutrients, and here's why you need them. So I think that this, I think this is actually pretty consistent with the Maryland Attorney General opinion. And then the action, the action of these nutrients on the body, I think that's also a lot of the stuff we talk about. Like, why would you want to take creatine? Well, here are the things that happen when you take creatine. And then a couple other, uh, and then a couple other things as well. So I think that these actually give a lot of leeway. Ohio also released something called Bulletin 8, which gave some further examples as to what falls in this. And I mean, th this is not as helpful for us, but it still kind of shows here are some of the things we don't consider medical nutrition information. Um, you know, again, number three, I think is helpful for us. Talking about carbohydrates, proteins, fats, minerals, and water as essential nutrients needed by the body and how nutrient requirements may vary through the life cycle. I think that's a kind of what we do to some extent. So, I think when we look at these four sources, we can somewhat distill down uh, some best practices. And I think the first best practice is, unless, you're, unless it's an important part of your business, don't give nutrition advice. And this is a decision that you're gonna have to make for yourself. If you're primarily a programmer, and you're primarily somebody who coaches lifts, 
don't give dietary advice. You know, if, if you're abstinent and you can't get pregnant, it's sort of the same principle here. If you don't give nutrition advice, you can't be nailed by the Board of Dietetics. But to the extent that you want to, and I understand that some of you in here, I understand that's an important part of some of your all's business. And I'm not gonna tell you that you shouldn't ever do it because maybe one day you'll get called on it. But I will say know your state specific law and its exceptions. Because the reality is sometimes the laws are different. If we look at the, all that general nutrition information we've discussed, Illinois actually seems to buck the trend on it because Illinois does not allow you to create specific meal plans under their statute. So even though they use the same language, general nutrition information, they actually specifically tell you that you can't do something which I think falls under the Maryland and Ohio, Montana and, uh, and Nevada sources. To the extent you give advice, I would recommend giving general or non-specific advice whenever you can. If you do give specific advice, always put it in terms of performance. It's always about athletic performance. It's never about treating health. It's not about making us healthier. It's about making us bigger badasses. That's what we're concerned about. So we can lift more, we can run more, we can be faster, more explosive. Uh, this fourth one, don't put, objectionable, don't put potentially objectionable advice in writing. If it's not there, they can't nail you with it. That's what got Steve Cooksey in trouble. He had an entire website, so the Board of Dietetics had an entire record to look at. And then the last one is, I would recommend putting a disclaimer in any coaching contract that you're not giving dietetics advice. Is it dispositive? No. You can violate your own contract, but I think it's good evidence. And I think it will make it less likely that somebody will report you, frankly, if you're saying, look, I'm not giving you dietitian advice. I'm not a li licensed dietitian. I'm not holding myself out to doing that. Uh, can doctors give any sort of dietary advice if they're not a registered dietitian? The answer is yes. Every state has an exception to the extent it is incidental to your practice. So, now I didn't go over that because that's a pretty narrow category. Usually, medical doctors, it comes up more often. A lot of times there are other uh, professions like physical therapists, they, there, there are exceptions to that. Um, and and the, the exact uh, people who are exempt really varies on the state. Medical doctors are always included in that though. So to the extent that the doctor is just giving advice in the context of treating a patient for a specific purpose, that's been exempted in the past. You can put a stipulation if you get sued in your waivers uh, for, you know, for making sure that, a, that certain state laws govern. Can you do the same thing for, for dietetics laws? And you can't because that's, a, because that's something the state enforces. So if it's between you and a trainee for your own personal training or coaching, that is a private contract between you and that individual, so you two can set the terms for it. If it is you and the state, it would be like saying, you know, I'm gonna do a murder for hire contract and I wanna stipulate that this state's law applies because they don't have the death penalty. You know, it'd be along the same lines. So if the st when the state is involved, you don't get to stipulate what the state will do. Um, and the general rule on this has been that, you know, as I, as I think I said earlier, uh, the state that you live in and the state of the person you give the information to, you have to comply with both laws. And I think that's true, the, that's certainly true of the legal profession, um, that's true of, uh, of general regulation, and I think that's true of the medical profession as well. Sully would know better than I do, but for, at least from what I've read, um, anytime you're dealing with professional regulation, you have to comply with both laws unless there's an exception to that. And some states, by the way, do have dietetics exceptions for that. If you're licensed in another state, a lot of times they'll say, we'll give you a pass as long as it's substantially equivalent. So um, I think Ohio definitely has one. I think North Carolina has one. What if you have a medical limitation of some sort uh, and, they disclose, and a trainee discloses that to you? What do you do with that? Um, one, I, if they have something specific that could be concerning, like if they have a doctor order, um, I would put it in the waiver or alternatively require them to have a physician's approval. 
And usually for the waivers I do, uh, I will have a clause in there saying that either A, I have a physician's approval, or B, I am waiving that physician's approval and I'm taking the risk. Um, but if there's something specific, I would seriously consider putting it in, especially like if they have a heart condition or something. I, I, think, I think you're playing with fire to some extent, depending on the condition. But if you put it in the waiver that this could potentially be impacted and they know that, and they sign that even though they've acknowledged that's an issue, they still want to go on anyway. I think that's a way to protect yourself. But um, I know that uh, Rip had a post at one point, and I think, uh, I think Dr. Sullivan chimed in, that there are certain conditions they just don't even touch because there's just too much risk for an injury. Uh, and I, in the article I wrote, that's in the footnotes, I cite to that particular exchange. But I actually agree with it in a lot of ways. I agree that there are, there are probably certain things I would stay the hell away from. Um, if somebody is, for example, anorexic, uh, I think there's a lot of potential for that person getting injured doing what we do. Now, now, to be fair, there are cases where people had medical conditions going in and the waiver was sufficient to, uh, to uh, release the gym and the, and the trainer from liability. So those cases certainly exist. It is a rule, um, but it's just something you have to be a little bit extra cautious of. And that's why, I mean, I'm sure everybody in here does it. You know, when you take on a new trainee, you ask them explicitly, is there anything I need to know that can affect your ability to perform this? And there's a reason why we do that, because if they say no, and then they later say, well, I had a heart condition. Well, that would have been nice to know three weeks ago before you, know, you decided to Valsalva and whatever. So, um, yeah. One more thing. You know, I see in this room a group of people, and certainly on the, and the roster in general for those who couldn't be here, a group of people who have the ability to fundamentally change how this profession operates, the ability to fundamentally change how the public thinks of exercise, and the ability to make people's lives better. But I'm sure you've all heard rumblings that there are some attempts in certain states and around the nation, and sometimes lawyers call for it too, to regulate our profession, to basically require us to uh, agree to a certain set of principles in order to get a state <coughs> license. Now, for a long time, this was purely hypothetical, until this year. Washington, D.C. now regulates personal trainers. They passed a statute in March of 2014 saying three big things. Number one, you have to register and, and pay a fee to practice personal training in D.C. Not so bad on its own. Only registrants could use the letters PFT or RPFT. Again, not so bad. Here's the third one, though. The Board of Physical Therapy regulates the practice of personal training. And here's the other issue. This is the entire, this is the entire law. What that means is the Board of Physical Therapy is going to have unfettered discretion to pass whatever standards they want. Now, in Washington, D.C., there were two different professions added along these lines. Athletic trainers, the guys who go out on the field and tend to sports players, and personal trainers. Now, in an April of 2014 meeting, uh, the Board of Physical Therapy said they were going to do the athletic trainers first. So they're currently drafting those regulations. Those have not come out yet. They're going to then turn to personal training next. We have no idea what those are going to say. I think there's a pretty good chance, I, pr I think there's a pretty good chance that the starting strength certification will not be considered an acceptable certification. And I think there's a good chance there will be an exam involved that will, where you'll have to, uh, you know, where you'll have to basically regurgitate certain principles. And, they, and the board is going to have enforcement authority over this. And we don't know exactly what that looks like. Now, I know what you're thinking, not in my state. Last five years, states that have considered regulating personal trainers, actual bills in the legislature, California a whole bunch of years, although ironically they stopped after 2010. Florida, 2012 through 2014, that bill just died in committee two months ago, fortunately. 
Georgia, 2006 through 11. Maryland, 2008, 2010. Massachusetts, 2007, 11. And the last two years, that bill is probably going to die in committee as well, but it hasn't yet. New Jersey, 2008 to 11. Texas, 2011. Rip did not know about this, by the way, when I brought it up to him. Now, here's something to notice, too. This is not a red state, blue state issue. This is not a liberal conservative issue. Those states are a pretty diverse set, with a pretty diverse set of, uh, of political outlooks. So what I would say at the end is, because I believe in this group, and I think you do too, if you hear rumblings in your state that they're considering this stuff, and even if, you hear, even if you have colleagues in other states that might be one of these, speak up. Call people you know, call the legislators. They're all local legislators. There is no federal regulation of dietetics. Frankly, there never will be. And I can say that fairly confidently. This is always going to be at the state level. Call legislators, get mad, get angry, make noise. That's why all of these have failed, because every time they've been proposed, the personal training industry has risen up in almost unanimous opposition. They called their legislators. They made noise. So I would exhort you to do exactly that if you hear it. And let's try to you know, continue building the brand that we've all been trying to do. Well, thank you very much. I know I am the one thing standing between you all and Dr. Sullivan. So I think it's a good idea that I stop talking so we can hear his stuff.